Hello, South Knoxville Church of God. Pastor Jerry here. Hello, guests. We're glad you're with us today. Uh, this evening is our last study in the Wielding of, of the Sword of the Spirit series. Uh, actually, this is, uh, this is the 12th video, and we had an introduction. We had, uh, we had nine lessons. Is that correct? Ten lessons. And then uh, now the conclusion. So we've got 12 videos total, including tonight. And uh, so what we're going to do tonight basically is, is th this is the conclusion. This is basically a summary of everything that we've covered. We won't go into all the details. There's not time for that. And if, uh, if you have missed any of these or if uh, these videos spark an interest in you, uh, you can go back and watch any of those videos. They are available. Um, they're available first of all on, uh, on on my Facebook page. That's the easiest place to find them. Just type in Louder Milk and Wielding the Sword of the Spirit. They should come right up. Uh, you can also go to the, the church um, Facebook and you can look back through the time stream and it might take you a little while to find each one, but they're all there. And uh, so those are available. They have been also showing on the church web page, but they are not in the archives there. So if you want to see them, you have to go back to one of those other two sources. Um, let's go ahead and get into the word. But before we do, let's pray. Uh, there's a lot going on in our world. Pandemic is still going on. Um, there's, there's unrest in the nation, actually all over the world. Um, I, I mentioned on Sunday a few weeks ago that uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7 talks about nations rising against nations and, and, and really it's ethnicities rising against ethnicities. That is, uh, it's at an all-time high right now. As I'm recording this, uh, I'm recording it a week beforehand approximately. So uh, as I'm recording this, I'm not sure exactly what's going on when you're watching it, but uh, there's a lot going on right now. And uh, so let's pray for our nation. Let's pray against racism. Let's pray against uh, all, all the hatred. And let's be the, the light of Jesus Christ in the world. The world needs to see the love and the light of Jesus like they've never seen it before. Also, pray for uh, pray for your brothers and sisters. By the time you see this, we should have already had our first service back in the sanctuary, and uh, we'll be preparing for the next week. So uh, uh, be in prayer for one another for protection, and uh, let's give God praise for all He's done and all He's doing in our church and in the in the body of Christ in general. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be gathered in your name, and God, you said where two or three are gathered in your name, there you're in the midst. We might not be present in person. Uh, some are watching this perhaps in their bedroom, some are watching it perhaps in the living room, some on the front porch, whatever, uh, looking at it on their phones or on their computers. But we know that you're there with us all, and we're gathered together in mind and in spirit, even though we may not be in the same room. God, we invite you into this study today. I pray, God, that your spirit would rest upon everything that's said here. Help me, God, to, to, uh, to, to do justice to, to the word that you would uh, want to go forward and help our ears and our eyes to be open. Lord, your, wor your word says repeatedly, he that hath ears, let him hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. And so, Father, we pray that our ears will be open to your spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Now, this being Wednesday night, this is our Wednesday night uh, regular Bible study, um, and I want to just share with you that, uh, of course, South Knoxville Church of God is a nonprofit, and you can give by just texting the letters SKCOG to the number 77977. That's SKCOG, which stands for South Knoxville Church of God, to the number 77977. You can give also by going to the church website, uh, skcog.com, clicking on the Give button and giving there. Now, um, we've been talking for, as I said, this will be the 12th week. For the last 12 weeks, seems like it's flown by. So the last three months, basically, we've been talking about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, wielding it properly. To wield means basically to handle. And we're talking about the, the Word of God in terms of uh, using a sword and because we're talking about the sword of the spirit being the word of God and and we know that our our scripture for that has has has, show, has told us that 
that the, the word is sharp and powerful and is able to, uh, to even dis discern or to divide between the, the bone and the marrow and the spirit and the soul. So the word of God is, is something that, that is, is not only uh, very powerful for the equipping of, of the, the saint for the work of the ministry. It's not only powerful in, in cutting away the, the carnal man, the flesh, but it's also power, powerful in spiritual warfare against the enemy. So as we're talking tonight, keep all that in mind. I wanna take us back first to uh, lesson one and, and just remind you what it was about. Lesson one was about the fear of the Lord. We used as a key scripture uh, that Proverbs chapter nine, verse 10, that says, and, and if you'll remember, we're using the New King James Version in this study. The scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So we understand according to this scripture that if we really want to, to, to know the Holy One, if we really want to, uh, to gain wisdom, then we, we need to begin our pursuit of God, our, our understanding of his word, the search of his word with, with, with wisdom, uh, with, with knowledge. So that begins with the fear of the Lord. If, if we don't fear God properly, if we don't honor his word properly, he is not going to open up to us the word of God that, that is so powerful and precious to us to the extent that he would like to. If we hold him to the highest regard, if we truly fear the Lord, if we truly honor him, if we truly honor his word, knowing that he honors his word even above his name, we've talked about that several times in this study, knowing that he has, has ordained that this be the guide for our Christian life and, and knowing that he has breathed life into the word. And if we understand all those things and know that this is the, the written word, that Jesus is the living word, then we, we begin to understand how, how precious the word of God is to God and then we'll hold it to a high standard. And according to the word of God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I think that when we fear him properly, we will also honor his word properly. Just looking down through here at some of the things we talked about, um, this is this is uh, this is not to be scared of God. It, it's it's filial fear, which refers to that that a, a child would have for a loving father. It's it's a it's a fear, respect, and honor that uh, we should display toward parents. It's an extraordinary love that they have for us, and we should respect the father, the mother, and certainly in this case, the Lord and the word that he has given us to, to a very great extent, and in the case of the Lord, to the greatest extent. Um, we, we've also talked about other benefits of the fear of the Lord, uh, but, but what we really want to get to is that the fear of the Lord brings wisdom. And I want us to, I want us to have wisdom, basically, is, is understanding how to put knowledge to use. We can look in the word of God, we can find what the word says, we can even know what it means, but if we don't have the wisdom to put it to use, then, then we, we, we're not gonna, it's not gonna really profit us anything. And we're talking about handling the word of truth or wielding the sword of the spirit properly. So that all begins with the fear of the Lord. That's just an overview. Um, I, I, want, I want to point out too, before we go on from there, that 2 Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration. The, the literal translation here says that it's God breathed. I've already made reference to that. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. So the spirit of God has breathed into, or he has breathed out the word, and we should be he, he exhaled it. We should be inhaling it. We don't have to worry about COVID-19 with God. He is, uh, he is breathing out his word through the scripture. We should be breathing it in and taking in every, every breath, knowing that he has is, he is empowered his word. He has empowered his word. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear him properly, trust his word, honor his word, hold his word to 
an extreme standard in your life and, and you'll find that uh, you begin to, to, to understand. God wants to reveal his word to you, but he won't do that if we don't honor him properly. So that was, that was lesson one, uh, just an overview. Lesson two, we talked about where the Bible came from and all the different translations. Now, um, I'm not going to go into a, a, a lot there, but I'll share a few things. And uh, we, we know that um, the Word of God was, the, the Bible even tells us that it was moved by God upon men of old. And, and so they received from the Holy Spirit, as I just referred to, God breathed out His Word. They received of it and they, they wrote it down. So in its original texts, uh, that, that's, what, that's what's trustworthy, the most trustworthy. If we look at the, the Old Testament, of course, the, the, the original text was written in Hebrew. Uh, if we look at the New Testament, some of it was in, uh, some of it was in Greek, some of, it, some of it I think was in Aramaic. But we, we need to look at the original transcripts to see exactly what God was saying because when we translate from one language to the other, whether it's the Word of God or just a conversation, there's something sometimes, most often, lost in the translation. You know, if we look back, God, He, uh, he confused the language for a reason. He confused the language as we read in, in Genesis talking about uh, the Tower of Babel. Babel. Uh, we, we, we see that he confused the language so that we couldn't communicate and, and accomplish the purpose of, of those evil men of that day. And we today have the ability now to, to translate and, and we can gain great knowledge and we can move forward. But if, if we're wanting to get to the very truth of the matter, we have to go back to the original language. And uh, so that means that every translation has its flaws, and that even includes the King James Version. And many of us grew up with the King James Version. We love the King James Version. We trust it as, as the most trustworthy text in English. Most of us do. Um, but still, there are flaws. There are, there are more flaws in, in, uh, in certain versions than in others. We have, uh, this is all part of we've talked, what we talked about in Lesson 2. We have... Uh, we have word-for-word uh, -word translations. We have thought-for-thought -thought translations. We have, uh, we have, I think there might be one more that I'm forgetting, but there's also a uh, paraphrase. And if we want to know the very best understanding of what God had to say, we, we shouldn't go with paraphrase. That's like, uh, it's like me saying that uh, the, the stove is hot uh, but not telling you that it's uh, that it's burner number two in the front. Uh, it's it's not the first one over here. It's the second one over here, and it's hot and it's very hot and it will burn you. We might just say the stove's hot and and leave it at that. Uh, but there there's there's a lot lost in a paraphrase. And and so if we get thought for thought, we might get closer, but we still may not get the the true understanding of word for word. Word for word though would tell us exactly what the word meant. Um, that, that was used. And even that falls short. That's why I say it's the original text that they are, are the most trustworthy. Even that falls some short because the words of the Hebrew and of the Greek are far more, uh, they're, they're far more descriptive. And, and the word that, that tells me uh, that, that, that God so loved the world, agape, uh, if we just read it in English, God so loved the world, we, we get the idea that God loved the world. And this is a word for word translation, but we don't get the picture of, of what agape means because there's also, uh, as far as love goes, it could have been translated as love in our, in our Bible, could have been filial uh, love, or it could have been, um, I'm sorry, uh, phileo love, it could have been storge, it could have been all these other different type loves and, and eros and, and they, they translate as love, but we see the love that God loves us with are not these superficial type loves or even a deep intimate friendship type love, but a love that, that is, it goes beyond human capabilities without the help of God. It's an unconditional type love. He loved us so much, unconditionally loved us that he gave his own son, that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Everybody won't receive it, 
but he loved us all that much unconditionally. He loves you whether you hate him. He loves you whether you return his love. And, and so the, the, even the word for word falls short, but it is the most trustworthy. Thought for thought is a good one in some cases because it helps you get the picture that, that the, the word for word misses in some ways. But when we really want to get the fullest amount, we need to go back to the original. You say, well, I don't understand or read Greek or Hebrew. Uh, there, there, are, uh, there are tools to help you. I'll talk about that in a few moments. We've already covered that just a few weeks ago. Um, but we, we also can get uh, Bibles that, that are side-by-side -side Bibles, for instance. You can get a word-for-word -word and a thought-for-thought side-by-side and get a good full meaning. A lot of things available to us today that weren't available. Um, one scripture that I'll read uh, related to this, um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, I charge you therefore, brethren, and the Lord Jesus Christ, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from aside from the truth unto fables. So we need to know the truth. Don't just trust any version you find out there. Make sure what it is you're reading. Don't just trust a paraphrase. It's not trustworthy enough. If your reading level is, and, and that's all that you can get, it's better than nothing. But we, if your reading level is too low, but I believe with all my heart, and I know of people who couldn't even read, and they asked God for help, and they read and understood and preached his word. So God can give you understanding. But uh, be careful what versions you read. Make sure that they that they translate well. And um, my preference is uh, to, to get a word for word. King James, New King James, New American Standard. If you're going with uh, if you're going with a thought for thought, um, there there are some that are, are pretty good, and there are others that I don't trust as well. A New Living Translation has a mixture of word for word and thought for thought. It's a pretty good version. It's easy to read and it's, 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 uh, it's pretty trustworthy. So um, just wanna touch on that. Now I'm, I'm gonna move on. So I wasn't going into too much, but I think I just did. Um, lesson number three was searching for Rhema. And as I've said, we, we kind of build on this. Uh, every, every lesson helps take you deeper in understanding uh, how to use the word of God properly. And so when we're talking about rhema, um, we, we should understand that, that uh, rhema is, is a word that, that really means um, basically the, the word comes alive to us. It's, a, it's an understanding of the word of God. Um, when, when, we, uh, when we realize that the word of God can come alive to us, we realize it's not like any other book. Uh, we, we can read the word of someone else and it can have great impact in our lives great meaning but when we read the word of god there is a there's an added dimension and as a matter of fact god has i believe hidden levels of understanding deeper and deeper in his word and if we want to know the truth of the word of god we really need the 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 rhema a, a rhema word a word that will that will come to life and let me give you a scripture here um, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says, for the word, I've already mentioned this to you, but for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than if, even any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, so we need, in, we, we need the word of God to spiritually enlighten us even to our own condition. We need the word of God to come alive to us, to, 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 open our spiritual eyes to things that we might have missed. We need the word of God to enlighten us and that's what Rhema is all about. When we begin to read the word of God and the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to understand what is happening or what is being said there, then we, we, we get a Rhema word. And the word tells us that the things that God reveals to us is for us and our children. And, and I want us to understand, we, when God reveals a, a truth to us, a secret to us, when he reveals that to us, 
then he intends for us to take that truth and to live by it and to grow in it and to share it with others. Um, I, I mentioned there that it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that rhema. Well, that is, uh, that's lesson number four. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. And we, we, we need to understand that uh, when we read the word of God, the, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 12, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But what we have so often thought was that just meant to, to read the word would increase our faith. And I do believe that it, it, it does play a part in it. But the word comes alive in us. There's a rhema that comes alive in us. That's when the word uh, really increases our faith. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word or the God-inspired word, God-breathed uh, word of God. The Holy Spirit, the word tells us, will lead us into all truth. Um, the word says he will teach us all things. Let me read that scripture for you. John chapter 14, verse 26, New King James Version. But when the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, uh, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you, bring to your remembrance all things that I said unto you. So if we... If we get a rhema word from God, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. If we, if we are allowing the Holy Spirit to, to move in our lives, he will teach us things that we could not learn, learn on our own. You can go to seminary, Bible school. Uh, you can spend years. You can spend, um, you, you can spend lots and lots of money, but you'll never understand the truths of the word of God without the helper, the Holy Spirit, speaking to your spirit. You, you, you'll get some great knowledge, but again, back to the wisdom to be able to understand how to use the knowledge. It won't happen unless the Holy Spirit is really moving in your life. And again, that won't happen unless you fear the Lord properly. And, and, and we won't get that rhema, that, that revelation understanding unless we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. I can read all day, and some people say, well, why can't I not understand the Word of God? Well, perhaps you're trying to understand it with your carnal mind, and you've not allowed the Holy Spirit to really begin to reveal it to you. And that's what we have to have to really understand the Word of God. So we're talking about, in Lesson 4, we were talking about the Holy Spirit, the teacher. Now, Lesson 5 is uh, talking about those layers that I mentioned, the, those, those depths, and it actually was called More Than Meets the Eye. Um, I've heard people use the, the analogy of an onion, how you peel off one layer and there's another, and you peel off another and there's yet another and another and another and another. And, and the Word of God is, is, is similar in construction to that, and it can only be that the Holy Spirit, God himself, uh, constructed the, the, the Word because it's, there's, too, there's too much there that, um, that there's no way possible a man could have put this together or men could have put this together. There's no way that the 66 books of the Bible could have been written by individuals over the course of thousands of years and be in such synchronicity and, and, and bring forth such amazing truths. And I know people will say this contradicts that. If you understand the truth of the Word of God and, and look at it in the big picture, the Word of God does not contra contradict itself. It builds on itself. And there are truths that supersede other truths. It's, it's true that uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But we find that in Hebrews, the Word tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It was a temporary appeasement. And what the, the truth is that overwhelms the, the shedding of blood from bulls and goats that was done in the Old Testament is that Jesus Christ became the sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So there are truths that, that supersede other truths. It's just like an airplane uh, that, that uh, it, it, it's, it's bound by gravity. It's too heavy. Uh, to, 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 to fly or to be above the ground and not fall. But the, the law of aerodynamics 
supersedes the law of gravity. When it gets enough lift under its wing from forward motion, it begins to rise. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. There's more there than meets the eye. And the more we study, the more we'll learn, the more we seek after God. The Word of God tells us in Jeremiah 20, uh, 29, 13, you'll find for me when you seek for me with your whole heart. And if we, if we begin to search for God with all that's in us, with, if we search for him with our heart, we'll find him. And, and as we're searching for him and reading in his word and spending time in prayer and, and really going after God, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal these truths. We'll get these rhema words. We will we'll find hidden truths in the word of God that are far more than meets the eye. I told uh, a, a few of these in, in lesson five. I talked, I believe, about how there is a hidden message in Genesis in the genealogy of Jesus, the first uh, number of names spell out a, a message of salvation, and it is absolutely amazing. Uh, that's not readily seen unless you uh, do a name study, and then all of a sudden it jumps off the page to you. I've checked that out. There's truth to it. There are lots of other, uh, other things like that in the Word of God. It is amazing what all is in the Word, and there's more, that meets the, more than meets the eye. So uh, that was lesson five. Moving on to lesson six, um, we talked about how uh, the Word tells us that faith uh, comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We did mention that one again, but we talked about how the Word tells us in Matthew chapter 7 that uh, we should ask, seek, and knock. You'll remember that video probably because I recorded it at Abundant Life in Ohio. Still use that video of knocking on the door. Secretary answered the door. Um, I walked down a corridor, showed you some places that knocking uh, and waiting and seeking and, and asking allowed me into. And, and so if you saw that, uh, then you'll remember that, that sometimes we just ask. I could, I could have stood at that door and asked and said, let me in, can I come in? Nobody would have come. They wouldn't. It wouldn't have happened. Uh, but if I if I if I sought a way to get in, I might have found a door that was unlocked. But there wasn't a door that was unlocked, so I, I had to knock. And when I knocked, then the door was opened unto me. The Word says in Matthew chapter seven, verse seven through eleven: Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. Uh, you can read on from there, but that was verse 7 through verse 8. Um, we, we have to do the same thing with, with the Lord. Uh, if you're not understanding a truth, ask him for revelation. Ask him for that, that the Holy Spirit would lead you into truth. Ask him for a rhema word. If, if, you, if you are still not receiving that word, seek the word. Look through it dig to see how it how it relates to other places in the Word. The Word of God is not. It's not that one chapter um, has its own truths and another chapter has its own truths completely unrelated. They are related. They might not all uh, they might not all seem to be related, but the truths are related. There's one big picture in the Word of God and then there's a lot of little truths in the Word of God. The big picture is that God loved us enough to redeem us. He he loved us enough first of all to create us knowing that we would that we would sin and still in spite of ourselves even before the foundation of the earth the lamb Jesus Christ was slain so that he could redeem us unto himself the picture in the whole word of god the big picture is that god wanted fellowship with you and he loves us and he has made every attempt that we might have relationship with him but there are a lot of other things that we find in that big picture have you ever seen one of those pictures that you look at and the more you look at it, the more you see? It's, it's kind of like that. There's so much in the Word of God, layer upon layer, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, and the Lord wants to reveal those things to you. But you have to ask Him. You have to seek. You have to knock. And sometimes, like that woman who knocked and knocked and knocked at the door of the judge, we will receive because of our persistence. And God wants to reveal but he wants to see how hungry, hungry we are for revelation, I believe, sometimes. So um, that was lesson six. Lesson seven, um, we talked about praying the word. Now we're starting to talk about actually wielding the word, using the sword of the spirit. And, and so 
if, if you want your word, your prayer to be powerful, you need to pray the word of God. God has already breathed it. He's already inspired it. He's already spoken it. When we pray it, we're coming into agreement with him. We are declaring a declaration, another separate but still connected method of using the word of God. We're declaring that that we believe what his word says is true. We're standing on it. We're we're telling our man, our carnal man, get in alignment with this. God's God's already said it. We're we're declaring it into the heavenlies that the prince of the power of the air hears what we're saying. We're we're saying I trust God over the circumstances that that are going on around me. And then God hears it and he honors his word as I told you already. He honors his word above his name. Now, uh, that was was praying the the word. So let me just quickly say you can you can find scriptures that apply to your situation. You can you can pray those scriptures. You can if if you don't if you if you're wanting to spend time in prayer and you don't really have anything to say, you've said all you know to say. Flip the word of God open and and pray what Jesus called uh, what we might call the disciples' prayer, what we call the Lord's prayer. But Jesus said, pray this way. Uh, we could pray the 23rd Psalm. We could pray from a bunch of the Psalms that talk about uh, about receiving forgiveness or restoring joy or finding hope. We can pray these things and they're powerful because they're, they're there in the Word of God. So we pray what God has spoken and we, we find that there, there's power uh, in, in, our, in our prayer when we pray that way. We're coming in agreement. The Word of God tells us that if two or three agree as touching any one thing, that God will do it. But we realize that when we align ourselves with him, when, when he is the other half of the two-part two party agreement, then we're really looking at, at uh, a powerful prayer. Um, lesson eight was, was study techniques. Um, I, I talked about uh, 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 hermeneutics. I talked about uh, exegesis, eisegesis. Uh, without going into all of that, and it's a it's a very uh, very big difficult study if you really get into a lot of it. What what we really have to understand is that the the word is not written. It's not written for. It, it's written so that God could hide truths from those who really didn't need to know them and reveal truths to those who who love Him, and so. With that understanding, we, we see that according to the Word of God, basically we, inter we interpret Scripture with Scripture. We read Scripture in context. We can understand it from its context. Um, and, and we even Sunday, I mentioned John the Baptist when he was when he was speaking of Jesus. He said they were they were wondering if he was the Messiah. This was by the time you watch this, it will be two Sundays ago. But wondering if Jesus, or if he was the Messiah, and he said, "I indeed baptize you with water, but one is coming after me, uh, who's who, who is mightier than I, whose who sandals I'm not even worthy to unlatch." And it says that he will baptize you, speaking of Jesus, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then it goes on to say that he has his winnowing fan in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and that he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. So here we are seeing fire. In context, we see that the fire he's talking about is the fire of judgment, and judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. And he's not just talking about pouring wrath out, but that he judges, our, our I believe, our, our carnal man and, and purifies us with, with his Holy Spirit, with his fire, with trials. He purifies us. And we see that in, if, only if we look at the context. So many people have so many ideas of that, but the, the, the truth is hidden right there in the Word of God in the context. He, he, is, he is thoroughly purging his threshing floor. We are the wheat. We have an outer hard shell. He wants to break that off of us, blow it away from us, then burn it with uh, unquenchable fire. And it's found right there in the context. So we have to, we have to understand what the word says by looking at the word and don't trust so much everything that every commentary says and i may i may re relate to that here again in just a moment because most of those 
actually all commentaries are the thoughts of people. Some of them have been influenced by the Holy Spirit, but some have only been influenced by the, the knowledge of other men. And so we have to, we have to limit our trust of, of commentaries and we, we need to trust the word of God. And, and we, we should never go into, uh, we talk about this in, in eisegesis, we should never go into uh, the word of God to prove our point, um, our, our, our ideas, but what we should do is go into the Word of God to see what our point should be, what our ideas should be. If you go into the Word trying to prove a truth, you may be able to prove it if you have only a few scriptures and, and take it out of context. But if you look at the big picture of the Word of God, then you'll get what your doctrine should really be based on, what the truth really is. Um, okay, that was uh, study techniques. And then in lesson nine, we talked about cutting edge study tools. This was just two weeks ago. Um, and in those cutting edge study tools, I recommended um, a total of, I believe it was eight different uh, websites and or apps and or apps. And uh, one of them is, is, I don't have my phone in front of me, it's here somewhere, but one of them is, uh, is Uversion. Uh, it's a Bible app that's on your phone absolutely great for reading on a daily basis, having the Bible with you everywhere you go. There are study plans, there, there are reading plans, uh, it's really good. Talked about Evernote, which is where I keep my notes and what I'm looking at right now. It's, it's, how, uh, and, uh, it, it's how I keep track of, of all the different thoughts the Lord gives me in my study uh, in my private time. And I can develop that into to sermons later. Uh, it's a great tool, it's a great, it's a note-taking app actually but you can put links in there that you can jump straight to places. You can put your thoughts, you can, uh, you can record them, you can put hashtags and, and, uh, and, and we can uh, even put uh, tags that you can, you can search for. Uh, for instance, if you're looking for holiness, you can search for that. If you're looking for sin or righteousness or judgment or forgiveness or whatever, if you have any messages or any notes, uh, any study, uh, that you've done that relates to that, it will pull those up. It automatically offers you a related note if you have some that are already created. Uh, Evernote's a great study. We talked about, um, uh, first and foremost, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, uh, notebook, pen and paper. Anytime that you're studying or praying, you should have those things handy. And of course, the Holy Spirit, I mentioned him, but the Holy Spirit is our helper, our teacher. He's the the, the best part of study, he will lead us into truths. Talked about biblehub.com, gateway, uh, biblegateway.com. I talked about studylight.org and, and the dictionaries that were available there, biblestudytools.com and those commentaries. As, a, as I said, I'm not a big fan of commentaries because they're, they're very often just uh, men's thoughts, but uh, one commentary that I really love is available there. And if I look something up in a commentary, usually I'm going to John Gill's exposition of the Bible. And it's, it's uh, I believe that uh, he had a, a, a helper called the Holy Spirit leading him into truth. And, and he did a great job in putting those together. He's from more than a century ago, I believe, but it's a great study tool. And um, that's available at BibleStudyTools.com in the commentary section. And then my favorite um, Bible study tool is probably blueletterbible.org. And that one, I talked about how the original language was, was, uh, was much more detailed. That one, you can go to a scripture, punch in, uh, for instance, John 1.1, 1, 1, and, and you, can go to, uh, you can go to that scripture, and then you can look at, in the beginning was the word, you can look at word and see what, what is used there. Um, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You can look at all of those individual words and how they were made up in the original language in Greek and see what they mean. And sometimes they're far more descriptive in the original language, which it uses Strong's Concordance and Vine's Concordance, um, but it's far more descriptive and you can get a far better understanding than what you can see in the English language. This is one of the best tools that I use in preparation for study and to and to learn what the word is actually saying. So I encourage you to, uh, to go back to uh, lesson number nine. There is a link in the comments section on YouTube and on Facebook where you, can, where you can click on that one link and find all these, or actually that one comment and find all these links available to you. Um, 
And then lesson 10, which we talked uh, last week uh, about um, applying what you have learned. And um, there, there, are so many, there are so many things that we face today that we need to be able to wield the sword of the Spirit. And what we talked about uh, really here was how do I apply what I have learned through this study? And, and again, let me just encourage you, if you've missed some of these or all these, they're all there available for you. And I've put hours and hours and hours of study in. And, and I'm not bragging on that. I'm just telling you, I have, I have really done a lot of research here. I've really spent a lot of time on this. And I believe in gleaning from others. And so with what I have put into this, I encourage you to go and take advantage of it. It doesn't cost you a thing. And, and learn what you can from me. Surpass me if you can. I hope you do. And, and, and take this knowledge and teach someone else because we want to wield the Word of God properly, the sword of the, the sword of the Spirit properly. So how do I apply what I have learned? Uh, one of those ways is uh, I take these tools and I study the Word of God so that I can rightly divide the Word of Truth. That's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. If we don't study it, we'll never learn it. If we don't read it, we, we won't even know what it says, but if we don't study it, we'll never learn it. If we don't learn it, we can't really live by it properly. If I don't live by it, I can't expect the, uh, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit to, to empower me to be able to be victorious in, 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 my, in my walk with the Lord. So study the word. Then as, as I've already told you, one of those one of those ways to apply it is to pray the word. It's the most powerful way to pray. When we declare the word of God and stand on it and believe it and say, God, you said in your word, or Satan, get behind me. The word says this, just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness, that's powerful. So again, we apply the wielding of the sword of the spirit lessons uh, about, uh, about praying the word. Um, we, we can declare the word. I've mentioned that. The word, uh, the word tells us that, that um, faith comes by hearing. I've mentioned that over and over and, and hearing from the word of God. We, we, should, we should understand that we need to know it, and if we know it, we can declare it. If I will say it, it will not only increase my faith, but it will tear down strongholds of the enemy. And it will, I believe, spring... Uh, heavenly realms into action. When when we honor the word of God and believe it and stand on it and pray it and and trust it, uh, I believe that God God will empower His word in our lives. And not only will it come alive to us and be a rhema, but it will also begin to be that sharp two edged sword that He's he, He's called it, it to be and called us to use. Uh, and then. We should, so we should declare it, but we should also be living by the word. The word of God tells us in Matthew chapter four, verse four, uh, we don't live by bread alone or by, by food. We, we, we basically live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So this is not only uh, a sword. It's not only something we can declare. It's not only uh, something that's alive and sharp and powerful. It is our life. It, it's not only our bread, it's our life. The word of God is is he spoke the worlds into existence and then he made us from the dust of of what he had spoken about we are made from the dust of the spoken word of god and so it's powerful it's it's bigger than we know and so we should understand that um that we live by the word of god take the bible and learn it and live by it and live in its pages and live in its power. Uh, and then, uh, then the, the last one I shared with you was weaponizing the word and basically uh, using the, the word of God as a weapon against the attacks of the enemy. We, we, are, we are told in the word of God that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds or pulling down of, of, of uh, fortresses basically that were built up against us or built up in our lives. We often hear people talk about, uh, for instance, generational curses. The word of God can tear down those, those curses that have been against you by the sins of your father. The word of God is powerful. It can tear those things down. We need to weaponize the word. We fight 
the devil with the word. I mentioned Jesus already uh, just a moment ago, using the word of God to combat the enemy. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to weaponize the word. Satan cannot stand against the word of God, so we need to use it in everyday warfare. All right, so that is a summary of everything that we've talked about in this, uh, in this 12 part series. And today, just before we go, I want to, I want to remind you that there, there's, there's a couple things that you should, you should always do when you're studying the word to, to, to wield the word, uh, to handle the word of truth more, uh, more effectively or to wield the sword of the spirit. You should always uh, begin your study with prayer you should always honor the word of God to the highest extent. Uh, we we should we should um, we should not take the name of the Lord in vain. But when I say this, you'll understand why I said that. We shouldn't take the word as as though it's 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 just carnal or common or unclean. It's powerful, and it was spoken by God, breathed out by God, and His words carry life in them. So we should. We should esteem it highly and we should, we should use it properly. Don't use the word of God to tear somebody down. Use the word of God to edify. Use the word of God to build people up. It's okay to use it for reproof and rebuke. The word of God, we just read that a moment ago. It's, it's for that. But it's ultimately so that we might become better Christians and more powerful in our walk with him. Uh, we, we have the armor of the Lord and the word is the only, uh, the only offensive weapon that we are told about when we talk about the armor of the Lord in Ephesians chapter 16. We have, uh, we have all the different pieces of armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, but we have the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith, and we can go into battle. The shield is defensive. The sword can be defensive or offensive, and we're fighting the enemy. So now I guess... As we're about to, to close today, I should I should ask you one question, and and I want I want you to I want you to consider this, and I'll give you the answer, but I want you to consider this and maybe make a comment uh, in in the in the comment section below. I, some of these weeks I gave you homework. This one's your homework. You can do it right now before you leave this this uh, site. But does wielding the word properly take um, does it take discipline? And I'll tell you the answer is yes. And I want you to comment on why you consider that it takes discipline. Let me give you a couple reasons, but you tell me why it takes discipline. It takes discipline because the enemy's always trying to pull us away from it. The enemy is always trying to keep us from staying out of the word because if he can keep us out of the word, he keeps us weak. If he can keep us from understanding how to wield the word, then he can keep his strongholds, his fortresses, build up in our lives, and we don't have any weapons to really tear him down properly. Uh, why is it? Why do we have to 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 diligently study the word of God? Because it's as is told in the parable of the sower. The enemy is trying to steal away the seeds that we have that we have received. We we, we it will take discipline because we're so bombarded by so many things in this world. And there are many other reasons. So share, share your thoughts in the comments below. I hope you've enjoyed this study. I've enjoyed putting it together. I've enjoyed teaching it to you. I, I hope that you have re re enjoyed receiving it from me. And I just pray that you would share these videos, that you would, uh, maybe this one's a good, to, good one to share because it kind of has an overview of every lesson. And there's more detail in most all of these that you can go into and just get into a greater study. But share this, uh, tell others that God is, is taking us deeper and then let's go after him together. I want you to be able to wield the sword of the spirit uh, to handle the word of God properly, to, to, to be good at wielding the word. We have to study it to show ourselves approved. We have to, to learn and we have to listen to the Holy Spirit. We have to honor the word of God and humbly seek after him, ask, seek, knock. And I believe with all my heart, God wants to reveal truths to us and make us far more powerful, speaking of the body of Christ, than we have ever been. The world needs the power 
of the Holy Spirit working in the church who knows the Word of God right now, today. And He's called you for such a time as this. I pray that you can pick up the Word, the sword of the Spirit, wield it properly, and make a difference in this world. And I know you can with the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the truths that you have bestowed upon us in this study. God, some of these, uh, some of these studies were full of scripture. Some of them were full of, uh, of tools, different things. But God, I pray that each one has ministered to the hearts of your people. And I pray that, God, as we move from this, uh, this study into whatever comes next, that your blessing would be there as well. And I thank you, God, that you're a you're, you're, you're working behind the scenes on our behalf and that you're willing, God, to pour your knowledge and your understanding into us through the Holy Spirit, the teacher. And we thank you and we welcome you. And Lord, teach us your word so that we might properly handle the word of truth. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight for wielding the sword of the Spirit. I don't know for sure, but next week I'm considering... Uh, beginning a study on prophecy might be a few weeks away uh, talking about prof prophecies from the Old Testament, New Testament, prophetic words from the Word of God not so much from uh, from people around the world today although some of those things are still going out and there are some amazing prophecies that you can hear. That's not my point. My point is to, to stick to the Word of God and see some of those things are coming to pass before our eyes right now. If, if the Lord allows me, we'll go there next week. If not, it'll be maybe down the road. But God bless you. I love you. We'll see you Sunday morning at 1030 if you can be here. Talk to you later.